Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, you already met uh, Marco. Marco is, a, is an activist uh, who works on transparency in Croatia. And you've met uh, Andrew Keane, who gave us this uh, controversial, I guess, uh, perspective on uh, transparency. And here's our third speaker, Jan Ham. Is, um, uh, the spokesperson for the working group on um, enterprise and environment of the Pirate Party uh, in the Parliament of Berlin, and is one of the advisors to the Federal Executive Board uh, of the Pirate Party in Germany. Uh, so, uh, uh, these people uh, have a different like, job, different perspective, and um, different take on uh, transparency, on privacy, on how they have to balance in this in society and how the process is changing. So, uh, I have like uh, I prepared like few questions uh, to analyze the uh, the topic. So, uh, transparency and um, and privacy. Uh, what is the balance and uh, can transparency turn, for example, uh, into uh, into dark, like into not in the in Andrew's sense, but into populism. Can it, how can it be misused in society? Um, Jan, want to start? Well, I'm I'm glad you mentioned the term populism because what we just heard is populism at its top. It's just like f spreading fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And there was only one small section in this speech where we kind of got a glimpse of what Andrew really wants. Uh, and of course he wants to sell his books, he wants to tour the uh, speaker circuit and present his theories there. That's, I think that's what you make a living with and I'm fine with that, okay. But um, it all comes down to being able to handle what data companies are using. And if you just boil it down to the principle of data autonomy that we have legislation that um, provides each individual with the right to know what data is collected, what data is used, uh, then I don't see any problem here because when someone wants to have a Google account and wants to have his emails crawled by Google's algorithms and knows what the consequences are, I have no problem with that. I don't want to say to people, no, you're not allowed to do that. If someone chooses this, and knows the consequence, I'm fine with that. But I'm also fine with that a situation in which someone says, no, I don't want uh, Facebook to have my data. I personally don't have a Facebook account because I know what Facebook will do with it. I have a Twitter account, so, which kind of doesn't really make sense. <laughs> I don't have a Facebook account, but we have to st stop somewhere. So it's my choice not to have a Facebook account. I'm not using the service. I don't get the benefits of the service, but it's okay. That's my own choice. And so I don't see why we need new dark places. There are dark places in the internet, Japanese image boards, for example, but I guess there are other problems associated with that, and I don't really think that's where we should go. We should all calm down, think about it. You already talked to Mrs. Redding, which is, I think is great. We should also talk with Mr. Albrecht, who's the rapporteur on this issue, um, and look at how can we like, modify the proposal and see how we can really enable people to do whatever they want with the data and choose what to do when they want to do it. Um, wants to answer, Andrew? Well, um, I think you, I think, w have you ever tried to use it or read one of the terms of service? On, on these social networks? Yes, I have, and there are people that uh, create performances out of it by reading iTunes uh, <laughs> terms of service on, on right. stage. Yeah. So, for example, the LinkedIn terms of service is 6,000 words. You probably need to hire a lawyer in, in order to understand. I haven't read the Facebook one. Um, so I think you are... Um, you, you're assuming that people are, are much more knowledgeable about these services and much more literate about terms of service than they actually are. And I think that there's a, there's a deep degree of bamboozlement and confusion. Maybe not so much about us, we're all in the business, so we understand the risks 
and the implications. But for most people, most people don't understand this stuff. So there is a need for, for more. I mean, I, I think you're not necessarily disagreeing. There's a need for legislation, right? There is a need for legislation, definitely. And there's a need for legislation that people don't really need to read through 6,000 words. Right. So the I think legislation has to be phrased that people can assume that a certain standard is kept by internet companies. But at a certain point, we have to trust them, that they know what they're doing, because otherwise we end up in statism. That's where we lived in the last 50 years. That's not the place where I want to live, where the state decides everything for me. And I'm a left person, but at a certain point, I want to decide what I can do with my data and when I can do it and where I can exchange my data for a service. I want to decide it myself, but I also want to know what the consequences are. So the legislation has to reflect that. That's like what we or I think would be the best. And Mrs. Redding should reconsider this. I'm just not as optimistic as you. I think in the, in the US in particular, um, the, the, the government is increasingly sclerotic. It's miles behind, literally and metaphorically, miles behind technology. It doesn't attract good people. No one takes it seriously. So many of these big data companies are running rings around government. And so I think you'd be right. If we were living 50 years ago when the state was powerful and when governments could impose draconian laws on corporations, you'd be right. But actually, in our age, things have been turned on their head. Corporations are much stronger than governments. Um, there was a good debate on TechCrunch last year between Tim O'Reilly and Reid Hoffman. Should we fear government in this big data age? Should we fear government more or corporations? And you know, depending on the government, but it seems, in particularly in the US, that uh, the corporations actually have a lot more power than government, it can certainly get things done and can move faster and have more resources. I mean, look at how much money Apple have. Certainly more than practically the whole American government has. So I'm not as optimistic as you. Maybe Europe and America is different, and maybe the European uh, legislation will be more effective. But I'm sympathetic, for example, to some of the antitrust investigations of Google. It's a different debate, but I think that's not a bad thing. So I don't actually think we disagree. No, we, we actually we, we, we are on the same side regarding this. but. I think you are over, overdoing this with your fear mongering. I've never overdone anything. <laughs> <It's like laughs> <laughs> <laughs> I know at, at Mrs. Redding's approach, like one aspect of it is come up with a comprehensive data protection recast in Europe, and maybe the United States will move in that direction too. That's, for example, that's what Jan Albrecht hopes of the Green Party, who's a rapporteur on this. Who's, that's the the, the I, let me ask you about the pirate. It, so. I, I'm, I'm fi I mean, I'm sympathetic in some ways to what, what the Pirate Party is doing, but I think that there is a strong element of libertarianism now in, in, in the Pirate Party, and you articulated that in, your, in, 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 your pres in what you said. Um, and I think that we need to be more sympathetic to government. I mean, that's my view anyway. But mm -hmm. that, that, that this deep fear of government is wrong for the most part. I mean, it's, it's, it may be justified in, in, in outside Europe, but not in Europe. Well, okay. I'm, not, I'm not wearing a tinfoil hat, but in, <coughs> no. maybe Marco can say more about this because Croatia is not, wasn't really a stronghold of democracy in the last couple of years. So, no, I would just like to point out that if nothing is sold to you, then you are the one being sold. So that, that's what happens on the internet with the Facebook. So Andrew and I, although he, he phrased the, his speech, that we are basically both uh, going to the same point, but maybe from the opposite side. So more or less, you know, the, the person or entity who owns the information is holding some power over you. So either it be it Facebook uh, against which Andrew is fighting or the government against which I am fighting. So my way of fighting it is that if the government owns the data, we should take that power from the government in, in exposing it. Because plenty of people in the government are, base, are, are using that information to hold on their power with it. So we should expose it as fast and as efficient as possible. And of course, I'm all in favor of rule of law. 
and I'm trying to do whatever I can to improve on that one, either in Croatia or elsewhere. There were, I had an interesting debate in America with someone, a libertarian, about this issue. And we were talking about the right to forgetting, and they were strongly opposed to it. They said that future generations have a right to our data. But I think what's happening in our big data economy is you guys are political activists, right? So you're very much focused on the political, but you have not only the, the confusion of the public and the private in this world, but as you have the disappearance of the private, you also have the disappearance of the apolitical. And that's one of the dangers of the destruction of privacy. So I, I think that the, the right to forget is a personal issue, it's not a political issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll give a little background uh, for those who are not into like EU politics, uh, uh, because Jan mentioned um, uh, Commissioner Reading and uh, Jan Albrecht is an MEP. There is um, a project of a uh, law on uh, on data retention, and one of uh, of the pillars of this uh, of this law that is, is going to be drafted like soon um, is uh, the right to be forgotten as also like um, Andrew was talking about. So uh, the right, like there are lots of things in, the, in this drive, so data portability and other things, but also the right to be forgotten. So the right to ask that your data could be erased from the internet. So what's your take, for example, on the right to be forgotten, on the persistence of data, also considering like it's a um, studying and uh, analyzing the, the impact of, uh, of technology uh, and um, writing a lot about privacy and transparency, I got to know that in Germany there's a quite a peculiar attitude, very different from other places in Europe, a very, lots of attention towards privacy. So where's the balance there? Like you're in favor of transparency and you explained us uh, why and how, but where is the privacy? Like you, you were one of the people who raised the hands when Andrew asked who is not on Facebook. Yeah. Right. So. Um, I think we have, we have to be careful. We, we should not mix two things up. Privacy is like the, the area of data in the private realm and public data. So we're not talking about open data here. We're talking about private data. And of course, the right to be forgotten is an important element in this because private data is private business and nobody if, if I don't want my private data to be out there, everybody has to respect that. So I'm, I'm all for Mrs. Redding's proposal. There's no doubt about it. There are other problems connected to that, like, for example, should we do this through a regulation or through a directive? That's why I see the problems. But the general approach that she, uh, that she has and the proposals or the different proposals in that first draft, I'm fine with those, but I don't think they will, like, prevail because the big Googles of this world, the Facebooks of this world, they will, and I think I'm on your side on this, they will dissolve this, water it down in the co-decision process in the upcoming years, and in the end, we will have a data protection level that's much lower than it is today in Germany, for example. It's higher than in Ireland, maybe, but it's lower than in Germany. That's where we are critical. So I don't think that something like um, the right to be forgotten will remain in the final draft. So, but it should be in there. So if, if you could take this proposal today and say, okay, today we'll bring it through the European Parliament, we would be fine with it. But we really have fears that it won't make it in this quality right to the end. Okay, but for example, let's consider, uh, Marco, you expose uh, corruption scandals from the government, so a few po politicians were involved, like few people were involved. So the right to be forgotten is about like data, so also criminal records. Uh, what if uh, the right to be forgotten is approved and mm, people like the, the one uh, were uh, involved in corruption scandal ask to delete this kind of data? So it's uh, personal data, uh, health data, uh, but also it can be like former like, like criminal records. So there's all this kind of data. Is it right for this kind of data to be erased from public memory? Well, f first of all, I don't see how it is technically possible. I simply, you know, you can write a law, but you simply cannot enforce it because 
There are like 200 countries all around the world and there will be always two of them at least who will host anything uh, without a regard for, for, for privacy laws or, or whatever. So I believe that we should rephrase that uh, somehow else. So, or we should uh, simply learn how to live with the new environment in, in which we're obviously living. I mean, it's still like 20 years after the widespread use of internet, it's too early to tell what the internet will look like in, in five years. I mean, if you recall internet five years ago or seven years ago, we didn't have YouTube at that point in time, we didn't have Facebook or it, it was just starting, we didn't have Twitter and suddenly everything has changed in a very, very short period of time. And what, what does it all mean, you know? where it will evolve. You know, is there another Facebook already working somewhere and we don't know about it? You know, may maybe the whole thing will shift to something completely uh, different. And even if you decide to delete something, you know, from my timeline on, on Facebook, if I d uh, decide to cancel my Twitter account, you know, the data I have published is uh, republished on plenty of other places. And uh, if I disclose a database, it's again copied and pasted to plenty other, uh, of other places. And you simply, I mean you can try, but you simply cannot delete every single instance of information. It, I, I don't see that as, I mean it's, of course it's possible, but it will take too much time to do that and to be absolutely sure that nobody made a private copy of your private data. Uh, so, uh, privacy and the future. Uh, in this, uh, in these few days, I've, I've got to like discuss a lot about what privacy means and what are different approaches to privacy uh, and uh, what people can do, like single single citizen can do about privacy in this like evolving, like changing s scenario. So. Uh, uh, it's always it's usually been said that in Italy people do not care a lot about like they do not fully understand they do not f they are not fully aware of what like the implication the consequences of uh, sharing information and uh, personal data. So what would be your advice in this respect? Like uh, the world is changing very fast and sometimes uh, the feeling is that we're not like prepared, we're not aware to, to face it. So what would be your advice to people to like, uh, use the privacy better, care more about the privacy, how they can practically do that? Oh, that's easy. You know, you don't do on the on internet anything you wouldn't show to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that. Yeah, but, with that. but then the question becomes, what about the mother? <laughs> <laughs> because I think that one of the problems with this one of the uh, one of the problems with this privacy debate is it, 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 it there's a tendency to turn it into a generational one between you know old reactionaries like myself and young people, and I think that's a mistake. One of the one of the reasons I got off Facebook was it was just so annoying to see people who my generation who I respect, who plastered the network with photographs of their infants and children. So, you know, it's all very well for not to show your mother, but maybe we should say what you wouldn't show your child. Well, I have, I mean, if you check my Facebook. <laughs> you I see. can't, I'm not I, on Facebook. Yeah, I have like a couple of hundred pictures and you won't see, I mean, maybe two or three instances of the picture of my child on it or my wife on it. I simply don't share that kind of information on Facebook because I'm aware from the very first day that the Facebook is a p public yeah. space. And I think one of the things that this introduces, and you, you may, you may, most of you probably won't like what I'm about to say, is that it, the government and people are actually in the same boat here. We're all, as well as entertainment companies, we're all, we're all being disrupted by the data revolution. So entertainment com companies are being swept away by people stealing their data. Individuals are being undermined with the way in which their data is being exploited and their private lives are, seem to be being exposed. And of course, governments are also 
under threat because they have existed historically around quite strict regimes of privacy and seem incapable of being able to do that anymore. So the way perhaps to, to solve these problems is not to see the problem as government or individuals or private companies or entertainment companies, but to see the problem right across the board as data management. And to understand, I mean, you know, maybe in Croatia or, or certain other governments, the, the governments are particularly exploitative or ex particularly corrupt. But governments in many countries are simply a reflection of the, other, of the culture anyway. To, rather than to vilify one group or other, is to begin to understand that one of the, the great challenges of our age is data management on every level. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would just, yeah, uh, just a short story. Maybe you read about it, and I, I think it, it nicely points out some problems. So there was a story a few months back about the girl who was buying supplies in Target store in the U.S., and uh, she used lo a loyalty card for Target, and uh, uh, based on their, uh, her uh, shopping patterns, they create right. personalized catalogs and sending them uh, to her home, and suddenly she starts receiving a catalog full of baby equipment and you know pregnancy stuff and so on, and. Her father calls the target uh, customer service and says, well, uh, she's like 18 years old and you are sending her all the baby stuff and what does it all mean? And the guys are checking and I say, well, so we are ap apologizing, but based on her shopping patterns, we have like 85%, uh, uh, we are 85% certain that she's pregnant at the moment. And we apologize because, you know, for the remaining 50%, we are not sure. And a few weeks afterwards, you know, the father calls again and says, well, your algorithm was right. And <laughs> she subconsciously started buying things which proved uh, the point. So, and that's faster than real time. Yeah, that's, I mean, <laughs> that's scary. Right, but that's the reality of this. Yes, and, and you could do that on basically all levels. I mean, uh, you can also do it in terms of government. You can, the, the government can be turned into that pregnant girl, right? Yes, or the, gover or the government can ex analyze our data, right. our, our patterns, and decide, you know, right. just basically having a cell phone in your pocket, they can more or less monitor your uh, position, you know, qu quite nicely, and they can decide at one point in time that your moving patterns have changed for some reason, which might at some point in the future uh, dedicate some policeman or someone to check up on you. There's a question from the ground. There. I have a question. Yes, Mr. Cantor. I, I'm confused with what the dark alternative is. Now, am I supposed to just close my computer and not use my computer? I mean, could you get more specific? If you don't like the thing in real time, do you want it to happen after the fact? You don't want it to happen at all? Can you get a little more specific than just complaining? No. <laughs> okay, thank you. I mean, because you can't, because that, that's a, a sort of a, a question of utility. You want, you want a, a, you want a five-point gu guide. If you don't understand it, um, or if, if not you, but if one doesn't understand it, then, then there can't be a guide. I think it's, it's, it's bound up in who we are. I mean, my book is, is, is reflective in that sense. It's not a, a programmatic book, and this isn't a, a programmatic issue. It's, it's how we evolve as we are as individuals. You have to think for yourself how you have evolved. And, when, and we all, most of us here, didn't grow up in this public world. So we acquired identities, personalities, uh, before this collapse of, of privacy. Um, and the, the question is, do we want to leave that as a legacy to future generations? So, so, I, so I, but I don't think it can be. You know, it's not like, I mean, I could say, oh, well, you have to be, some people are saying, well, don't be on Facebook on a Saturday, or have, a, have a, a social networking Shabbat. You can have those things, but I, I'm not sure if that's really the solution. So would you say that through education and informing people about these patterns, each person could come up with their own solution, right? Well, I'm always wary of people who use education as the solution, because education has failed us on lots of levels. And when people bring up education, it means that they don't really have a solution. 
Um, How about teaching or training well, or something teaching, other I, I than think the as, e word? As, as parents, certainly. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people here with kids, and they have the challenge of, of how to how to enable, you know, what what rules to set with Facebook and Twitter and all those things. So yeah, I think as parents, we all have a responsibility to both encourage our kids to join this network, to utilize it and leverage it, but also to keep back part of themselves. But again, it, whether that can be formally taught or is, I'm not sure. I mean, do you think it can be taught? So you see yourself as this great parent who's not educating but informing people. Well, I'm a terrible the, parent. The, the terrors yeah. and the, the evilness of the light and stay in the closet and don't come out. Or dark. Keep it dark. Well, I don't think that that's what I was saying. I think that um, you, I think that if you want to live in public, if, if we want our kids and the next generation to live in public, then there shouldn't be warnings about the destruction of privacy. But I think it can be done through stories. I think it can be done through books. I think it can be done through schools. I think it can be done through parents. I mean, there are many ways it can be done. I mean, certainly you're marketing your book through the light, right? You're not hiding the book in a closet. You're using the <laughs> yeah, internet but the book to sell not, books. Right, but the book is not, uh, <laughs> the book is not my self-revelation. I'm not living in public through the book. I'm, I'm just a writer making an argument which is, um, which, uh, which is relevant in our social media saturated world. I don't, I, I, my book is not a confessional. I'm not living it. If you can read my book, you won't learn very much about me. You learn about my arguments about social media. Uh, my, you, my book is not a, a Facebook page. It's not full of, of half-undressed photos of myself. Do you think that if you could live by the principles of the dark, um, you would show the darkness? Well, the book has a dark cover. Okay. Okay, thank you. Who is that guy? Huh? I'm joking. Uh, Jan, you want to answer to the question about privacy, yeah. and then I'm going to yeah, open back. the floor for questions. Come back to your f question before... Um, you ask what, what, what could be a solution to this. Well, I think lots of developers are here. Two principles that are Mrs. Redding's draft are the principle of privacy by default and privacy by design. So we don't need fear mongering or calling for dark spheres on the net. <laughs> I think it's just it's enough to enable people to be more data sparse, that they don't put everything on the net, and that they have to actively enable certain functions that uh, companies can like, collect the data. If they have to actively enable them, it's much more of their choice. If it's by de default set to off, then I don't see... Um, and the, 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 the hurdles are much, much higher. And Mrs. Redding really has put this in because it was called for, for by data protection officials since a couple of years. And we have to see whether this will like, make it to the end. I think, I mean, fear mongering, I mean, you can be critical without, I mean, you're, you're suggesting that anytime anyone's critical, they're fear mongering. Yeah. I mean, how else are you supposed to be critical? Your presentation was fear mongering at its best. Oh, well, thank it's you. Cool, cool. <laughs> but, <laughs> Rather but than I, at its worst. And I, and <laughs> I'm, I'm a, like, a very critical of, of data collection and I'm uh, opposing big data, but I'm also not wearing a tinfoil hat. You know so what? No, not right now, I'm not at home. <laughs> so, uh, so, no, I didn't hear what you said. What, you're not very what? I'm critical of data collection, Yeah. but I'm also not wearing a tinfoil hat. I know that people want to use Facebook, but make it their choice. And I don't have a problem with it. Enable them to do this whenever they want to, and when they not want to, protect their rights. That's what should be done. Okay, so I'm going to open the floor to questions? Are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Mario? I'm not sure whether this is a question, but uh, I think, you know, the presentation was, of course, fascinating and uh, intended, I think, was intended to be provocative and uh, perhaps more than it should have been, probably, because uh, uh, the fact uh, is that the internet is becoming darker somehow and for the right reasons that our friend here is mentioning and all this uh, 
uh, do not track movement and legislation being discussed, etc., goes in that direction. And the um, uh, and of course, it's debatable whether these or other measures are good or bad, or whether the balance between good and bad is you know where it it fits. But uh, uh, it's something that is just happening. Uh, where should we uh, stop, or should we stop at one point? And uh, at, speaking of the so-called right to be forgotten, there is uh, lots of things in that expression, and it's uh, in uh, one uh, Italian court went to the point uh, a year and a half ago to uh, order a newspaper to erase a perfectly true story from their database uh, because it was, quote, old, uh, unquote, uh, which, I mean, now it, the case is being discussed yeah. in uh, higher courts, but, uh, and uh, on the other hand, the Italian Privacy Authority uh, is trying to push um, a jurisprudence, shall we say, uh, that uh, try to uh, distinguish between new, uh, between um, newspapers, uh, databases, archives in the newspapers' websites as opposed uh, to the same databases being open to the general public in Google. Because the partners, uh, the pattern of, uh, of uh, using information and data are so different in the digital world than the uh, analog world that, you know, things are being discussed. Some of them are maybe uh, you know, I'm afraid of, I mean, like the core decision, but uh, things are yeah, going can on. I, do, I mean, this darkness thing, I mean, I, my book, I mean, I was only joking. I mean, I, I used the theme of darkness because it was just a way of following on from, from Marco. Um, I think you're right. I, I, I understand what the darkness is, and I'm not sympathetic to that. I'm simply, it was just a kind of, it was a metaphor. Sometimes computer programmers don't understand metaphor. Uh, not, of course, that I'm insulting anyone here, um, but you know, it's, it's just a it, it, it's just a metaphor. It's it's a way of thinking. I'm not being literal, okay? Well, that's not the right to be forgotten. That's depublishing. That's something that's completely yeah. And, and I agree. And Sorry, I, I would be deeply too, disturbed yeah. by 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 legislation that allowed people to obliterate data that they didn't want. You know, political data. I mean, that's the danger with... with I, I mean, I'm sympathetic to Reading's... I'm not a legislative person. I'm sympathetic to her thinking. But, yeah, I fear that in practical terms, it could be really corrupted in a way that will enable companies to, to, to destroy the public record. So I, I think you're absolutely right. I think, and I, I think it's, a, it's a very important debate. I'm in principle sympathetic but there are many dangers, and perhaps it could be legislation that would create bigger problems than the thing it's trying to solve. Yeah, but let's please not mix this up. One thing is censorship and deep publication, and the other thing is protection of privacy and the right to have your data on a social network deleted. That's two completely right. separate and different things. Let's not m mix this up. It will only confuse the discussion. Because that is completely wrong, what you just mentioned, when a newspaper is uh, depublishing articles. There's no doubt about it. But that's not affected by Mrs. Redding's legislation proposal. But then what happens if you're on Twitter? What happens when you have, say, co corporate accounts on Twitter or Facebook? And how do you distinguish between, say, a corporate or a political account and a personal account? I mean, as we have this merging of the personal and the public, uh, it, it becomes increasingly hard and confusing. It's, I mean, I agree with your argument in principle that those are the two divisions, but in practice, it's not always as clear as we'd like it to be, right? Yeah, but you have natural persons, so you can differentiate there that only natural persons have the right to have the data um, deleted or that the data can be forgotten because personal rights are tied to natural persons, so I don't really see a problem there. One is like a legal person, one is a natural person, so they can di you can distinguish. And then it's more like depublication, when a company, for example, is f forcing uh, a social network to delete tweets. Mm -hmm. There's another question. Uh, just one quick question that gives us 
I think, a nice connection to other speeches, and it's about open data. So how do you, in your experience, uh, in, for the past, for the present, and in the future, would you uh, imagine um, that open data issue would involve our lives as citizens in Croatia, which is not yet in the European Union, in Germany and Europe, and in other countries. So this big issue uh, also connected to the right of a citizen of asking the erase of public data as well, as long as it's legal, obviously. Thanks. Well, uh, the first thing to say is that, in my opinion, the, all the information government gets from their service is, by definition, public good, unless it deals with your personal information. And we know what personal information is. I mean, that's agreed upon more or less in every single country. So if uh, the government have the data, it should be considered as public good and it should be released under some terms. Some countries decide not to publish it, some governments publish it, uh, but you have to pay for it in order to get it. Some countries, and that's increasing trend, are just releasing the data, thinking or hoping that private entities, whether it's companies, organizations, or individuals, will reuse that data and create another new service out of it. So that's my uh, basic uh, thinking. So if, it's, if the data is in government hands, it should be uh, published. I don't disagree on that. I mean, I, you know, I'm not. But I, I do think though, that there is a way of over-politicizing this. There is a way of turning all data, of, of politicized, because you could argue that all data can be politicized, and there is a need to reestablish the difference. It, it, it's a real struggle to, to, to reestablish the, the primacy of the private um, in, in, a, in a culture where radical transparency has acquired a kind of uh, an orthodoxy. So I, I think, I don't disagree with you about government, but I, I'm concerned about individuals, not government. I'm, I'm, you know, we're, I'm we're arguing really about the same yeah. thing, I think. I, I'm concerned about the individual, but on the internet, you know, the, the, uh, the difference in power is a little bit shifted, you know. Previously, you know, without the internet, you could rarely get a support or public support to push some idea to, to, till the end and force the government to do something. Well, let me ask you this question. It's the old sort of WikiLeaks question. Are there areas you think where government should still have the right to secrecy of its data? Or do you think government should be entirely transparent when it comes to data? I didn't really understand. I mean, do you, think that, do you think that governments have the right to secret services, to spies, I to, to, I to data that they simply would never publish to the world? I would say yes. In uh, what areas? Terrorism, drugs. Uh, I mean, uh, catching criminals, child pornography, stuff like that. So they should uh, have some space for them to pursue the, these kinds of people. All data that is not personal and not security relevant has to be open. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, everything that's not security you relevant, you just pull that in what you just said. I mean, th there should be time limit because you know, we had a case in a couple of years back when uh, the list of uh, U.S. intelligence service people were, was published and they, they were compromised in the countries where they worked and they were trying to do some, let's say, good or bad stuff. It, it doesn't really matter, but the personal safety was endangered because this information was public. But I would say that after, you know, maybe you shouldn't publish everything right away. Maybe there should be some kind of time limit, like depending on the subject, five years, 10 years, 20 years, we should know what happened in Roswell. I, I, I want to know, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about open data in the classical sense. I'm not talking about intelligence briefings. I'm talking about data that the state 
accumulates and that you can build services on. Yes. And all these data, all this data should be open as long as it is not personal, reconnected to persons. Yes. And as long as it's not security relevant. There's, I don't think that anybody in this room disagrees with this. But is it viable to have a replacement to the, these private data companies like Facebook and Google? Is that what open data is? Um, a, a, an alternative to private big data companies? Three, once again. Is, I mean, I hear this term open data all the time. I don't really understand what it means. It seems like one, it could be an alternative to private for-profit data companies like Facebook and Google. Yes, it could be, but again, you know, there, there, there is no government-owned Facebook. There wouldn't be like a lot of, about personal data. Um, there are data for like data sets uh, about the environment, uh, data set about, uh, for example, there have been a lot, and the, the EU has a different legislation on data on environment, pollution, this kind of data. Uh, so there are lots of, uh, of I don't know, uh, employment, like uh, jobs that are being like, created. Or, like, there are lots of data that uh, the state owns that there are, are not related to personal data. And usually open data relates to these categories, not, not as much on, on personal data. So it's releasing data that the government has in a searchable format so that citizen can access and use them uh, to have a better understanding on some issues. Uh, there are, like in Europe, I think there are different kind of um, uh, level of access to documents, for example, because you can request uh, documents. In many countries, you don't have, uh, you don't need um, a personal interest, like a specific interest. You can just ask for documents. Uh, but, uh, for example, in Italy, uh, you have to prove that you have uh, is called, I think, legitimate interest. So it's, it's, it has to be something that affects uh, your life at some point. Yesterday at dinner, we were um, talking about this uh, airport in Berlin that was supposed to open in June, like uh, at the beginning of, uh, of this month. But then, like two weeks before the opening, they said that uh, they wouldn't they would have been able to do that because they were like late, they have a few problems. And uh, we were talking about uh, a lot of, for example, people that um, invested their money to uh, open shops in the airport. And the airport is not going to be open for at least one year, and they're going to lose the money. So, for example, in that case, uh, this kind of data, they, they, they could be, they, they, they're going to probably sue the company. But what about? The data. It has been said that probably the like the company did know that this uh, this airport would have been open. So, are they like uh, they are liable for this? And the people cannot prove like an average citizen cannot prove that if there are no data about like uh, construction and uh, um, like uh, permits to to build uh, and everything. So that's one case. Uh, yeah, of course, the, 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 the planning documents, they should be open. It's a public project. It's funded by public money. The planning documents should be machine readable. It should be published that everybody can take a look at this. It's not possible right now. Right now, the only way to get to this data is setting up an inquiry committee in the state government of Berlin, which is he will be headed by the private party. So. Um, that's like a big hurdle, and we have to put this into legislation that whenever the state is planning something, it has to be machine readable, and everybody has, to, has the right to take a look at it. So I don't see why this stuff shouldn't be published. It's not security relevant. It's not personal. Publish it. It's uh, enable people to come out with services on this. Enable civil rights groups to analyze this data, look for weaknesses. So mostly relates to accountability, uh, government yeah. accountability. Are there any other questions from the floor? Hmm? Of course. Okay, uh, just to recap a little bit, uh, I think maybe we can all agree uh, to a few facts. For instance, uh, public data should be public. Can we agree on that? Yes? 
Should yeah. we raise our hands? Uh, or? Uh, yes. Who, who can? Who can? Public, uh, public data should be public. Yes. What does that Everybody. mean, public? I mean, uh, obviously, it's public data, uh, so it is Collected public. by the government. Uh, can you give me some examples of yes. that? Uh, for instance, uh, economic data, uh, political data, etc. Census uh, data, weather yes. data, census data, weather data, data uh, things like that. Okay, and but but as, are, they, are they like the Croatian government? Are they not publishing a lot of publicly? Well, the Croatian government hasn't published a single database yet. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so I, I wouldn't say they are a good example of yeah. publishing. <laughs> but, but but my story, I, I mean. Yes, it happened in Croatia, but it's applicable everywhere. You know, you had a, f a f few months back, had a, you had an excellent example that a utility company of New York decided to uh, publish the data of energy consumption of every single building on Manhattan, which means that suddenly, you know, when you decide to, to rent an apartment, you can take into account the... Uh, expected energy consumption you will have to pay to either heat or cool that apartment and suddenly you are not only talking about the position you know the location 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 stuff uh, for your apartment but you will also take into account uh, utilities bill which you will have to pay so this is uh, one quite good example of uh, data which is collected by the utility company which is not necessarily public but it can be served in public good. You have traffic data, you, you can have uh, data about traffic accidents, you can easily spot yeah. the places. Yeah, but then what becomes, say, let's just use the example of traffic. Uh, Mike. Let's say traffic data. Um, so you have a government that, government that collects, say, traffic data. Now, traffic data would be very valuable to say, and, and there are companies now doing building apps for traffic. Does the government start to trade in that data? Does it charge the app maker to access that data so that they can create apps for the public? How does the business side of it work? Yeah, so, so basically you have two ways of doing that. There, there is a good uh, uh, document, you can search it on the web, from the guy called Rufus Pollock from Open Knowledge Foundation. It's a br British uh, document, and uh, basically uh, you, you can charge uh, uh, the source end of the information, so you can charge someone while you are actually collecting the data, and you can charge while you're disseminating the data. So it, uh, it all depends. Again, if the traffic data is collected uh, for normal police purposes of keeping the order and orderly uh, uh, traffic, then uh, this data is already paid for by the government and should be probably disseminated or uh, uh, published for free. I think given the fiscal crisis of the state, the, the, all this data actually can be a solution. It, can, it would encourage the government to be more entrepreneurial, which I think is a good thing. No, governments have a history of being a bad <laughs> entrepreneurs. In yeah. Not every, maybe in Croatia, but not everywhere else. Was British funny. Leyland. Yeah. Sorry, British? <laughs> British irony. British Leyland. Uh, I was joking. <laughs> no, British Leyland was the British car firm that was destroyed by the British government. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, so maybe uh, the, the, a second point in which uh, everybody could agree is uh, uh, private data should stay... I wouldn't say private. I should say private data should be in the hands uh, of the owner, the, the, the one uh, generating this data, who then can decide what to do about that. Can you agree on that? Absolutely. That's, that's the principle of data autonomy, and that's what we as a pirate party want. That's the ideal that we strive for, that you can decide what to do. But that's the problem. I mean, you're making it sound. You, you say, oh, well, public data should be public. Well, I'm not going to. I mean, no one's going to. Who's going to disagree? You say, oh, private data should be private. Well, that's just, again, it's just a, a truism. But the truth is, in the way many people are using these networks, that public and private have become so confused. I think half the people, including myself, who use Facebook, don't really understand whether or not 
they're completely private. Most, most of the 900 million people who use Facebook aren't aware of the default features in the network. So what you're saying is obvious, but the reality is way more complex and confusing and problematic. That's why we're here. If it was that simple, I wouldn't have written my book. These guys wouldn't need to be in politics. Yeah, but public here doesn't mean out there and available. Public means collected by the, the state. state. And it also doesn't mean that the state is just, just supposed to collect everything for data retention. It just means that the data that's already there, that we already paid for through our tax money, that it's not in a warehouse somewhere, printed on a, on a laser printer in big folders. It's supposed to be available, it's supposed to be machine readable. That's what's meant by public. And private is the private data. The private data can be public. For example, a tweet is private data, but it's publicly available on the net, it's published. So we need to be more precise here and to like, distinguish between those forms. That's the key. And I think you just think, pull everything on the public, which actually isn't really public, it's still private. Yeah, and, and we should also uh, provide for a situation where some information which is considered to be private, for example, a fact I'm a criminal is very private information, and it's a public good to have that private information uh, published. So at some point in time, it might happen that some very, very private information should be made uh, public. Why is that a public good to, to broadcast someone's a someone has a criminal record? Nobody says that. No, 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 of, no, of no, course. no, no. necessarily criminal yeah. record. For example, I decide to become a drug dealer or something. So suddenly you want to expose this kind of person. Or somebody is corrupt, that's also very private information. Well, the thing is, is if you're, you, you, there are people who ha were drug dealers who went to jail who were no longer drug dealers. And the problem, again, this comes back to this forgetting and this ability to reinvent and forgive. And that's the, the broader problem with this is, I mean, obviously, you know, drug dealers don't announce they're drug dealers. You know, they're, they're, they're revealed as one and they go to jail. But what happens when they're released from jail? I mean, uh, you know, what, what should, I mean, maybe even the, the issue of, of, of pedophiles, should, should that be broadcast? Should you be able to know that up your street is someone who, who had been in jail? What are the implications and the civil liberties of the person who has, um, who has been punished? Well, that question is absolutely nothing new because even a criminal has privacy rights and nobody's asking for broadcasting. It, 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 Crimin like but it per is new. Data. It, it is new because now we have this network that enables yeah. us to do it. Yeah, 250 years ago, people could write the names yeah, on the parchment but that's and, and the whole put, it, point. put it on the now door anyone, of the church. But that's, the same. But it isn't the same. That's it, is the the same. Whole, it isn't the same because very, very few people would do that. And today, anyone with, an internet, uh, anyone with an internet connection can do a search in their neighborhood for anyone who's been t to jail. So that's the difference. It's not people haven't changed. Well, We're no better or worse than we've ever been, but it simply enables that kind of behavior, which historically had been much more difficult. Well, fortunately, I live in Germany, where you can't just Google criminals online, because even though I would like to know if there are criminals in, my, in the area where I live, fortunately, I'm not allowed to, because that's not what I want. Yeah. Most people still have rights, and in Germany, that's not possible. That's a fact. It's not opinion, it's a fact. It's yeah. ridiculous, this yeah, concept. But, I'm sorry. But if you like that or you don't like that? Personally, of course, I would like to know whether there are criminals, but I also know that we would pay a high social price. We would allow to broadcast lists of criminals for shoplifting or whatever, or stealing or murdering people. I know that the consequence of publishing this data, and I think that everybody, everybody can agree on this, would be much too high. It's, there's a reason why we don't do this. And we could, could always have done this. You could write it on parchment, put it on the church, on the church door, even in the Middle Ages. Okay, people couldn't read back then. It wouldn't make much of a difference. I, but I, I would just say in the US, there is probably an app for that already. <laughs> enough somewhere. for that. There's an app I mean, for that. someone should check the <laughs> iStore and well, check it out. No, but, there's a, we but, have... I have to give Andrew like, a point here. He's talking about America where this in part is possible. So we also have to like, take into consideration 
the social surroundings of how these no, uh, think, think about one, one other thing, ju just one um, other thing. The, the sentences of the court are usually public. They, unless, I mean, at least in Croatia. So when you have a sentence of the court, it's published and it's public. Unless it includes a minor, so that then you, it's anonymized. So we have the solution. We need to make the world more like Germany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we have one final question. Oh, Mr. Keen already gave the answer, even without listening to the question. So uh, I thank my, all the speakers, Marco Rakar, Andrew Keen, and Jan Hammer <laughs> for the debate. Okay. okay. For those who, like for the few that are not familiar with the movie, it's Vertigo yeah. in Italian, it's La Donna Che Visse Due Volte. I know, so I know. if I you haven't no seen the movie, you can, like uh, Mr. King didn't give up the final, like the final scenes of the movie, so you can see it yourself. And thank you very much, and see you and next year. Thank you to Antonella Napolitano. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.